okay, we're now recording, so be careful what you say. I found it easier for me to remember to start the recording as soon as I bring up Zoom. And just have a couple minutes of dead time before I start lecturing than it is to try to remember to turn it on at the beginning of the lecture. So. Uh, I think the, the number of cases on campus is, is starting to rise of the virus. So let's be careful. We don't have too many weeks left in the semester, so it'd be nice to make it through without going online. Should I close the phone so we can take the final exams? Um, there's not going to be a final exam in this class, actually. But they move the finals beginning of the semester. The finals were supposed to be after Thanksgiving, mm -hmm. but then uh, they decided students aren't coming back to campus after Thanksgiving. They optionally can, but it's not required. So but that means we can't give face-to-face -face exams. So. And I'm, I'm not doing online final exams. Just hoping next semester will be better. We'll see. Come out with the vaccine. People. Take it. Well, I, 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 I think you're probably right. Uh, with the with the winter coming and people being closed indoors, uh, already in the winter states, Minnesota and Wisconsin, I guess it's it's way up there because people are being closed in now. So. The other thing that can help us is uh, if everyone got it right at Thanksgiving so that we come back immune at the beginning of the next semester. So. Block party. Pardon? Have a block party? Yeah. I'm not, no, I'm not going to suggest that. You don't need to. Okay, so the uh, good news is we have, well, there's 14 lecture periods left in this semester before Thanksgiving break, but only 12 lectures. So two lecture periods are for the last exam review and then the last exam, which we have right before the, the Thanksgiving break. So not too many more weeks. Um, so we're starting the last section of this course. Um, and so the first section was transmission lines. The second section was really vector calculus and electrostatics. This third section is really magnetostatics. And then also we'll look at plane waves, propagating waves, what happens when things are actually changing with time. So the, the electrostatics and magnetostatics apply uh, when you've got fixed distributions of charge, charge that's not moving, or DC currents. 
you know, steady constant currents, actually electrostatic supplies there as well. We'll talk more about just turn the alarm off. Let's see it snooze. Um uh and uh, uh magnetostatics where we talk about steady currents and um the effects of the steady currents we'll, we'll talk about simple motors generators as well this chapter is on conductivity it's uh pretty simple compared to the electrostatics chapter uh so it deals with we'll get to actually two forms of Ohm's law, what's called the electromagnetics, electromagnetics form of Ohm's law, or the point form, that's our basic definition, our, our definition between, between um, uh, fields and current density, as we'll see. And then we'll get to the form of Ohm's law that you're familiar with from your circuits class. Um, right now, we're, we're gonna talk about two types of, of current, actually, just so we make a distinction between them. Um, there's another type of current, actually other types of current, displacement current that we'll talk about later as well. So convection current consists of a, of a, of charged particles, moving in response to mechanical forces. Now this is what this is not what we normally think of as current or it's not the current we're used to dealing with but you can think of uh, a thunder cloud that's charged that's moving due to uh, wind as being a convection current. Or even if you charged up a, a metal object, a metal sphere, and tossed it across the room uh, as mechanical action, that could be, that constitutes a current. But what we're going to concentrate on this, in this chapter is what's known as conduction current. So I'll say nothing more about convection current um, probably for the rest of the semester, is charge moving due to an electric field. Basically, this is charge that obeys Ohm's law. And we, we have to actually generate generalize our definition of current to talk about actually current distributions. Um, we normally think of you know current in a wire as being you know constant across the wire across the cross section of the wire. At low frequencies, you know frequencies we're used to that's true. But at higher frequencies, the current tends to the flow, most of the current tends to flow closer to the wire surface instead of being spread out uniformly across the wire. So that's a radio frequency effect called the, the skin effect, the current flowing in the skin or the outer layer of the wire. So because of that, we need to, to deal with what we call current distributions or current densities. So we define a current density J as, so the picture would be like this. If, if we've got, you know, some wire here, and if you take a little surface element with a, um, we'll call that, Delta S is the area of that little surface. And then we'll consider a little sec segment of current that's flowing through that little differential area. And it's got direction, 
U, that's the direction of the current. And then it's got a little component of current flowing through that small uh, uh, area. So the, and the limit as delta S goes to zero, you get the IDS and then J has a vector direction. J, the current density is a vector. Normally, talk about current having a direction. So you could think of that as a, as a vector, but at this point, we've always thought of it as just being directed along the, the wire and never think of it as actually having a direction. So the units here would be current per surface area or amperes per meter squared for current density. So again, in the problem we've worked with, the current density would be constant across you know, any cross section if we cut the wire, the current density would be uh, constant across the cross section. Well, not cut the wire, in which case we wouldn't have any current, but if you could visualize the, through the cross section of the wire, the current flowing, we think of it as, as being constant. Um, the total current passing through a surface S then is just using our vector notation. It's the dot product of J and our differential surface, and then doing a surface interval over that. So it turns out in, in our normal case where J is directed along the length of the wire, this definition allows you to to take just a, a circular cross section to it, or you could slice through it at like 45 degree angle and, and have you know, an oval surface. The amount of current flowing through both services because of the dot product would be the same. Okay? It'd be the current actually flowing in, in the wire. As long as the surface, that whatever cut you made, included the, the edges of the wire. So a simple example, Let's say that J is Z directed and it's equal to 10 rho. So the situation would be like this. We've got some wire here. Again, it's not really cut. It's that circular wire and has a radius of five millimeters. And J you know, J is out now actually a vector field, right? And it, according to this equation, you know, the farther we get away from the Z axis, the greater, the greater the strength of J. It's zero right in the center of this wire. Now, I haven't talked about you know, how you would set up a current like this at all. You know, again, I'm not sure. This is just actually just showing you a physical, uh, an example problem using this concept of, of current density. And then uh, um, the problem is here we want to find the current. So, and you could use any cross section. Solving these problems, you always want to use the simplest possible cross section, which would be just um, cutting it straight across and ending up with a circular surface. And for a circular cross section, and our, our you can look this up. But this would be in cylindrical coordinates, where we're dealing with a cylinder with a fixed radius, but the surface area is, remember it's would be z-directed, and then it's rho d phi d rho is, 
the differential surface area. So that means our, our current here would be we've got to integrate the dot product is just 10 rho z dotted with rho z, so that's 10 rho squared. We pick up our, our okay, uh, 10 rho squared d phi d rho. Integrate uh, phi from 0 to 2 pi and rho from 0 to 5 millimeters. So this becomes 20 pi thirds rho cubed. That's after integrating by phi to pick up the two phi, the, the two pi, and then from zero to five millimeters, this turns out to be 2.618 uh, microamps of current flowing through the wire then. Okay, we've talked a, a lot about permittivity we haven't really talked much about permeability yet. You know, we, we used it some back when we were uh, um, talking about uh, transmission lines. We also used conductivity then, back then. Um, talk about resistance per unit length in a, in a conductor. But we want to return now and, and concentrate a little bit more on this conductivity. It's a material parameter okay, and we'll look at permeability actually starting in the, in the next chapter. But um, our fundamental formula involving conductivity is this one. It provides a material property, provides a basic relationship between our current density and the conductivity of the material and then the electric field that exists within the material. This is what's called Ohm's law. Often it's just called Ohm's law, just to make a distinction between this form of Ohm's law and the one you're familiar with from circuits. We'll call this one Ohm's law for electromagnetics. Uh, the equivalent form for, of Ohm's law for circuits would be I is equal to the conductance times the voltage, right? So this is a little different. It involves the current density, conductivity, and then our electric field in volts per meter. So this is sometimes called the, the point form of Ohm's law. So, but there are a vast number of different types of conducting material. And we can classify them based on the, the conductivity. So if the con if the conductance if the conductivity is, is zero, it's a perfect insulator. So an example of that might be free space. Um, we usually think of air as being a really good insulator, and, and it is, but again, we, we talk about breakdown, dielectric breakdown, if, if the voltage gets large enough, you can get arcing in air, and then air becomes a, uh, a good conductor, leads to lightning in that case. Um, if the conductance is really low, really low here being less than 10 to the minus 10, 10. And the units here are Siemens per meter. So Siemens is the reciprocal of ohm. But this would, these would be materials that are normally classified as, as good insulators. And these are more guidelines. If you look in a you look in a different text, you might find slightly different thresholds here. If the 
conductivity is less than 10 to the minus four, these are classified as, as poor insulators. And between 10 to the minus four and 10 to the plus one, you have what are called the semiconductors. So silicon, germanium have conductivities and that range sigma greater than 10 to the fifth, these are the good conductors. And then this includes most of the metals. And finally, at the, at the other extreme, an infinite sigma are your perfect conductors, which we called previously or perfect electrical conductors, which we called PEX in the previous chapter. Now, you know, if, you, if you look at this relationship for uh, a, a PEC, if uh, sigma here is, is infinite, that means you've got an infinite current density. Unless, which isn't possible, that would lead to an infinite current, unless E is zero, right, in our E field. And in a, and that's actually the uh, requirement we had on PECs in the previous chapter. So in, in a PEC, we must have E is equal to zero or equivalently, that doesn't mean that the voltage across uh, and, and the pack is zero, but it does mean that it has a constant voltage, right? Uh, e is the negative gradient of voltage. So if voltage is constant, that leads to an E field of, of zero. This is to avoid infinite J. And so we often make this assumption with, with metals, with wires, right? We measure the voltage at one end of the wire. You know, it's the same as the voltage we measure at the other end of the wire, right? There, there's no essential voltage drop in the wire. And that's not true, especially for long wires, but it's an assumption we often make. And so we would say that actually in, in that wire, that's equivalent to saying that the E field is, is zero in, in the wire. So and we often make this assumption for good conductors or for metals. This leads us finally to The last topic I want to cover today is resistance. Now, I'll probably slip up sometimes and say maybe conductance when I'm meaning conductivity, but there's there's a difference. Conductivity is this material property. Resistivity is the reciprocal of conductivity. That also is a material property. And I may slip up and say resistance when I really mean resistivity. But resistance and conductance are device properties. You know, what's the resistance of a length of wire, okay? you know, some particular cross section. Whereas the resistivity or conductivity of, of that wire, that conductor, just depends on the material it's made out of. Okay? The conductance and the resistance depend on conductor length, the conductor cross-section, as well as the conductivity, the material property. But we know from circuits that V is equal to IR or um, 
equivalently, I guess. I is equal to GV, where G is equal to one over R, which is the conductance. So how does this form of Ohm's law come about from this more fundamental form? We actually you know, state this as uh, our fundamental equation in circuits. But really, this is the more fundamental form, the relationship between the current density and the electric field. So we'll look at a case where we've got a conductor, a line along the Z axis. So Try and draw that. So it's a, it's a segment of a conductor. Just for convenience, I'll make it circular. And it's setting on the xy plane. So this would be my z axis. For convenience, I'm going to use cylindrical coordinates. This has a, a conductivity. This material is. Same material throughout, so it has a constant conductivity. It has, cylinder has a radius of A. It has a length of capital L. In the textbook, he uses a lowercase l for the length, but it looks too much. I can't draw a lowercase l. It looks like a one. So I'll just use a capital L. And we've got a voltage V applied across this conductor. Okay. And I'm making a connection here with ideal wire. <laughs> now again, what we normally think of as current I is flowing from you know, current flowing from the positive terminal of, of our battery to the negative terminal when in fact electrons are actually flowing in the opposite direction right we, we know that but our definition of actually conductivity is consistent with our direction of current flow, so, so J would actually be minus Z directed here. As would E. But remember the voltage increases as we go against the electric field. So that's the voltage would increase as we go from the bottom of this conductor. It's not a perfect conductor, it has conductivity. So with some voltage across it, we get some current flowing through it. Now, I'm going to assume the current density is, is constant across Cross section. In other words, J is minus Z hat J zero, or J zero is a constant. So it's direct directed in a negative Z direction. And I've already told you, and this is uh, this is an assumption that is that is invalid at high frequencies. Okay, but we're working at the DC case. Uh, it, it's applicable up until we get up into the hundreds of megahertz. Okay, so it's applicable at the frequencies we're used to using in electronics. But the current density is, is constant through the cross section. But this means that the E field is therefore 
constant. Because from the material property, P is one over sigma J, which then would be minus Z hat J zero over uh, sigma okay, over the conductivity. So again, our E field here. So again, this you know, this isn't the perfect conductor. We couldn't set this problem up actually if it, if it were a perfect conductor because it would lead to an infinite, infinite current. Uh, so <clears throat> the E field is, is constant. We need to calculate the voltage. Well, why calculate it? It's given in the problem as V, but I need to relate V to my electric field, more importantly to, to J zero to get a more fundamental formula. So V is the integral along the contour of E dot DL. That was from our previous chapter. And we know that we can take any contour, certainly the, the most convenient contour is the straight line along the z-axis. So E, substituting my equation for E, minus C, J zero over sigma. My DL is, that's in the Z direction. And that's just DZ. Remember DL is always positive. You use the limits on your integral. You know, <clears throat> if I were actually integrating from the top to the bottom, I would integrate from L to zero. But my DL length would still be, would still be positive. Or this integral is just a constant. This becomes L over sigma J zero then. This is the relationship between the voltage across that conductor and the, and the constant current density. The other piece of the puzzle is calculating I Now, here I could formally do this integral, but because J is constant across the surface, you know, it's, it's just the minus Z J zero, okay, that J is going, J zero is going to pull, pull out. And the, and the current is nothing more than the current density times the area. So in this case, it's just Z J zero times pi a squared. If I integrate, that's, which is the area of that circular cross section. The resistance of the conductor is equal to V over I, or plugging in here, I'll have L sigma J zero divided by uh, J zero pi A squared. And I get R is equal to L over sigma pi A squared for the resistance. or recognizing since pi a squared is the area, cross-sectional area, more generally, I would have R is equal to L over sigma A, which you, you may remember that result from physics two or even in circuits one, it's usually given, there's usually a little bit of discussion about resistance and how it relates to resistivity or conductivity. Um, 
this is the result I get, you know, if it were like a rectangular wire or a square wire. In every case, what I get here is actually the area and the denominator. So in general, the resistance of the conductor, and this makes some intuitive sense. Certainly, I think that certainly as the length gets longer, the resistance goes up. Um, maybe it's not intuitively obvious, but as the area increases, the resistance goes down. The resistance is inversely proportional to area. So the larger the wire, the, the larger the gauge of the wire, the less resistance it has. And then it's also inversely proportional to the conductivity. As the conductivity of the wire increases, the resistance, the resistance goes down. So again, that holds it at low frequencies. At higher frequencies, the, the current density is, is not constant across the cross section. And we don't, we don't have a circuits. Well, we have a much different form of Ohm's law for circuits in, in that case. So, Let's take a look at 22 gauge wire. This is what's called hookup wires. Typically the, the gauge of wire you use on your little breadboards for connecting components. So it's pretty small diameter wire. Uh, copper wire. The gauge is kind of redundant there. AWG is American wire gauge has Sigma equal to 58 mega siemens per meter. So it's 58 times 10 to the six. So that would put it in this good conductor category, which we know a, a copper to be, to be 58 mega siemens per meter. And if you look up the diameter of 22 gauge wire, the diameter is 0 0.644 millimeters. So in order to calculate, we'll calculate the resistance per length, which we put when we're dealing with transmission lines was what we call R prime. So A is I A squared or pi times B over two squared or pi times 0 0.644 times 10 to the minus three divided by two squared. So I got 0 0.3257 times 10 to the minus six square meters. The resistance per length would be R over L so from our resistance formula, that's just one over sigma A, or so with this value for A and the 58 mega siemens per meter, at 52.93 milli ohms per meter for the resistivity. So this goes back to, you know, when we're dealing with transmission lines, remember in our model we had Three parameters I had capacitance per length. We learned actually how to calculate capacitance per length in the previous chapter when we we're dealing with electrostatics. And then now with conductivity, we know how to get the resistance per length. The other parameter, the intrinsic inductance or the inductance per length, we'll look at in, in the next, in the upcoming chapters. I think I still have one more lecture dealing with conductivity in this chapter, but it's a short chapter. So if you think about 100 meters, about a, about a football field or soccer field in length of 22 gauge wire, then it would have a resistance of five ohms. 
So not much, and, and not much, and it's relative, right? If, you know, if you're building circuits out of one kilo ohm resistances, the five ohms is going to be negligible over a hundred meter drop. But you know, again, this is, um, you know, there can be significant drop in, you know, if you've got an extension cord that you, know, you chain a couple of them together and you run out 150 meters or something. You know, the five ohms, maybe it's not significant at the milliamp currents that we use in electronics, but you know, five ohm resistance with 10 amps of current that you might use for some small motors or something like that. Um, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a 50 volt drop across the line from one end of the line to, to the other, right? So you end up operating your equipment at significantly lower than if it were plugged directly into the wall, which can affect the performance of you know, whatever your, your drill, your motor, whatever you're trying to operate off, off a long extension cord. Um, again, this is pretty small gauge wire so most extension cords, which have wide, larger diameter, are going to have much less resistance than, than the five ohms. So, but still, you can get, you know, with a hundred meter, hundred meter of wire, you'll get a couple of volts drop just across the wire due, due to the resistance of the wire itself. That's all I've got for you today. So. We'll pick up here on Wednesday.